Hi, welcome to Friends with Brain Injury. And with us, we have Missy. Um, and she's one of our new hosts, and she will be, she will introduce herself and we'll get started. Hi, Missy. Hi, Mark. My name's Missy. Mark already told you that. <clears throat> and on March 17th of 1991, I do have memory issues from this, but I, um, I had been, I had been experiencing some really <clears throat> severe headaches. Excuse me. Um, I mean, blinding headaches, severe pain, like I had never known. But I finally went to the doctor, thinking that it was my glasses, because I'd gotten glasses within the last year. And I thought maybe my prescription changed, and that was what was causing the headaches. So I went to see my eye doctor on a Saturday morning. I drove myself there, and he t he examined me. He said, there's nothing wrong with your eyes. My advice to you is to see your family doctor and or a neurologist. Well, I was 17 years old at the time, didn't think much of it. But um, <clears throat> actually, that was on the 16th of March. The next day, I um, ended up with a ruptured brain aneurysm. And after my, it was probably at least 14 hours <clears throat> after my brain aneurysm ruptured, before I ever made it to an emergency or an operating room where they clipped the aneurysm. And back then, if you had a brain aneurysm that needed clipped, you were in the hospital for at least three weeks. Minimum stay was 21 days. Well, two weeks after my brain surgery, I also suffered a stroke. And I'm lucky to be alive, <clears throat> but at the time, I didn't feel lucky at all. In fact, I felt like I had been issued the worst kind of punitive uh, sentence that mankind has ever known. I really felt like there was no reason for me to be alive. I didn't know who I was anymore. I didn't know what I was anymore. I was so very confused. I didn't know which end was up. I had zero support, not medically, not from my family. And at 17 years old, I, I, I just felt like life was over. I wanted to die. I wanted to die. Didn't see any purpose in living any further. And to be honest with you, if it wasn't for my faith in God, I probably would have ended it. But, you know, I persevered. And my whole entire adult life has been very empty, very scary. Because I don't comprehend life on life's terms. And literally no one understands what's wrong with me. Because I'm one of the un most unfortunate ones. I'm highly intelligent. And it's a popular misconception that if you're highly intelligent, there's nothing wrong with you. So you're expected to function like any other highly intelligent person person but it's more of a handicap than it is you know helpful because when when you have a brain injury you've got this intelligence you remember a lot of stuff you may but for me the things I remember the most are the things that happened prior to the injury I struggle really badly with learning new concepts. 
learning new habits. I struggle with executive dysfunction. Um, I have ADHD kind of symptoms. Mm -hmm. My house is always dirty. I forget to take a shower. I know I need to take a shower, but then I can't, I just can't do it. Right. I mean, not that I can't physically do it. Something in my brain doesn't operate the way it should so that I can just get up, go get a towel and get in the shower. And I know that sounds crazy. No, I'm sorry. We've talked about a dynamia, which is the difference between um, understanding that you need to do something versus to initiate the behavior. This is very common in traumatic brain injury where um, it's the engine's running, but you can't shift into drive to do it. A dynamia is probably one of the biggest curses of like damage to the frontal lobe and that people with traumatic brain injury have. It is a deficit of willpower. It's not laziness. It's not the inability, but it's the inability to initiate behavior. Um, and it's very common with traumatic brain injury. Probably about 80%, 85% of people with traumatic brain injury have it. And people with strokes, especially anterior communicating arteries and either in left or right uh, and middle cerebral artery uh, damage also have problems with initiating behavior. Again, called adynamia. Um, very common. And very, a lot of people could use it for fatigue, depression. Doctors could use it for this too, because many of them don't have the education in neuroscience and neuropsychology, uh -huh. neuropsychiatry to know, oh, this is a symptom of that. And it takes a very regimented, structured way. And it takes usually an external stimulus. Uh, Kate and I have talked about like how to, how some of the ways to manage this here within our group. We've talked about as experienced survivors, you also are an experienced survivor, some of the ways to manage these specific symptoms, a lot of which you describe is, to, is frontal lobe um, disorders and our intelligence, because that tends to be skills back here, um, usually very intact and very bright folks. A lot of the frontal stuff, this executive syndrome, the ADD, ADHD kind of symptoms are here and organization, attention, focus. A lot of like will, a lot of like people are like, why did you do that or whatever? Frontal lobe symptoms. And that they're fairly right. silent initially. <clears throat> and we talk about a lot of that stuff in our company, with a lot of our videos on detours and things like that. And here we talk about a lot of executive dysfunction, hot and cold executive dysfunction. And there are some things that you can do, but a lot of it, unfortunately, is like traditional rehab is like highly structured schedule and things which sometimes we don't always stick to. And we use a lot of ADD, ADHD medications and things to help us with our focus. And, but yeah, what you describe is very classic and very devilishly hard to deal with um, because, but sadly, you're an incredibly good company very large company um one in 20 people uh have neurological right. permanent neurological deficit from acquired brain injury whether that's head injuries or whether that's strokes encephalitis sepsis near drowning cardiac arrest i mean the list goes on covid is going to have a lot more people joining the club and those weird kind of symptoms and it's like uh, nobody else has this. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Many of us have it. The problem is many of us end up kind of isolated and don't know and can't. And this is part of why you're joining us, uh, uh, my my band of merry men and women to, you know, help communicate and share our experiences and to learn from each other and to teach a lot of families out there. If you know this and see this in your loved ones, it's like it's common. And the ways to do it is like with lots of structure and reinforcing what you need to do it's like a shower every day or every night at xyz time always do it always and remind your loved one until they make it a habit and like i said i have a video with kate about we talk about that specific problem it's called a dynamia and tell your doctor hey dude this is a dynamia look it up read about it apathy it's between two extremes it's on a spectrum um stuff. but yeah no it's fairly common sadly i have it um, it's gotten better over time with the medication, a lot of structure and a wife will tell me, Hey, Mark, you'd be good. Yeah. I'm glad that you mentioned the, um, the popular misconception that 
I'm just lazy. I believed and... I'm just lazy <laughs> my whole adult life because, <laughs> you know, I wanted to do things, but I just never could. Yep. And I that's... thought, well, I'm just lazy. So <laughs> if I'm thinking I'm lazy, then of course everybody around me thinks, well, she's just sorry. She nope. don't want to do anything. She don't get off her butt to do anything. Well, no, I, I'd like to, but I can't. And that's why. And so, you know, now I, su I suffer <clears throat> from depression, anxiety, um, low self-esteem. I have CPTSD. Ooh. And... All of these things going against me, and and at the at the base of, of all of it is the fact that I feel broken. I feel like I'm not good enough. I'm not doing enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not fast enough. You know, and I can't keep up with normal uh, great the people. Normies. Yeah, I call them neuronormies. Um, yeah. <laughs> The thing is, you know, a plan, a plan is necessary and there are things that can be done, but it's one step at a time. It is structure. We, we don't multitask. And I don't like that word very much because no, nobody multitask. It's impossible, literally. But attention switching rapidly is a problem. And for those of you who do it. This, we don't do very well and our processing speed is slowed down. But again, this is a frontal lobe symptom and it's very common. So highly organized schedule, um, almost like, you know, it, it, it military type of, you know, at eight, I do this always do this, 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 allow yourself some space. Again, this is something I talked about with Kate because Kate and I do a lot of executive because again, we're experienced survivors. So, we talk a lot about executive dysfunction and executive dysfunction is exactly what you would think it is. It is problems with like running the whole show and people uh -huh. with traumatic brain injury that are very intelligent tend to have a lot of our problems tend to be in that domain and operating and managing our intelligence. It isn't a lack of the academic school skills, knowing what to do. It is in managing the gifts that we have. And so knowing what to do, um, I have a background in neuroscience. I'm a medical person. I'm a medical professional, and I'm a specialist in brain injury, ironically, as people tell me. And it's like, yeah, okay, great. But I still have problems. Even though I know all these things, I know what I'm supposed to do. I know all these things specifically about brain injury and traumatic brain injury acquired. I still have these deficits. I still don't do necessarily. It's kind of like the doctor who's overweight smokes. And yeah, there are those out there. I can tell you stories. Um, uh -huh. You know, it's still the right way to do things. And there still are ways to handle it. It's just a matter of taking it one step at a time, listing it out, and come back for support. That's what we're all here for. That's right. what friends, are, friends with brain injuries about. That's what we're here for. One, one big old family. There are lots of us, as I said. Um, so I wish I had found this place. 30 years ago. Like nothing like know? this existed. We're still learning. There's still right. a lot of shit we don't know. I mean, your average, oh, yeah. your average doctor gets three weeks of neurology. I spoke to a young, uh, to a physician or med student. He was almost done. I asked him how much time he got in neurology. He's like, eh, three weeks. That's it. All of neurology uh -huh. in med school. Three weeks. Are you kidding me? And now, if you're a resident in neurology, That's obviously sad. you get some more, but it's like it's not that in depth though is it it isn't and i when mean because no, they don't understand not. what it's like without walking in it and because i can't articulate what i go through because of my brain injury i struggle to articulate right. what i deal with from moment to moment plus i don't remember what happened to me yesterday you know, it could have been a horrible day, but yeah. today I wake up and everything's brand new. Right. I don't remember yesterday, you know? Um, and that's good and bad. Um, it for, has, its, you know, it has find... its good points. <laughs> yes, it does. But it I, makes I've... it hard to talk to the doctor. <laughs> 
Um, one of the best things to do is record the conversation. You know, use your phone and just always record. Even put a note in the appointment at the time you talk to your doc. Say, you know, put in your on your phone. That was something else Kate and I did. And I definitely would urge you to watch uh, on detours um, on YouTube, like where the ones that Kate and I talk about that. And one of the things she recommends is like to record and others do too. Uh-huh. Uh, record your experiences with a doc and jocelyn talks about that a lot too because she talks about she's a new survivor she had a severe tbi just like i did um Uh and it's a matter of like make sure you record because like well kate and i talk about because we've been friends for quite a while and you know we talk about how it's important to like structure things and she has to and i i need to have things better structured than i do because like i'll forget to check the phone i'll forget to even check my calendar so it's like it's good to have like paper notes or to i have my wife stacy who helps too but that's Uh not an advantage many people have because a lot of us have trouble with relationships friendships things like that and even if you do have if you if your if your friends all have brain injury, it kind of makes it hard because then we all forget to get it. You know, it's like a joke I have with my friends. Blind kids. leading the blind. Exactly. Well, we always say my brain lesion or yours, and usually it's both of us. Why we have communications problems? It's like, you know, and it's like right. when you and when you and I talk, it's always like um, or when we bump heads, it's usually because we both have holes in our heads, and it's like, darn it. <laughs> um yeah, that's the other thing i say it's like i got a hole in my head so it all kind of you know leaks out a sense of humor right. is essential but it's like uh yeah i forgot and i do the same thing you do it's like as i tell people it's like if i can get it into my long-term memory it's great it'll stay there forever but getting it past short term to long term is the problem so now if i practice something uh-huh. a whole lot yeah then it will stick or i gotta I, do it every day for months before i get the hang of it right and then it does stick and if it sticks there i know it'll stay forever um because i have a great long-term memory like you part of the high intelligence set almost everybody virtually everybody who is with friends with brain injury is really 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 smart however we also have some pretty significant brain lesions and it's like it sucks high iq tbi as they refer to it as they describe it um uh-huh. great and horrible because you're smart enough to know it sucks <laughs> um, right <laughs> i am of the opinion that those who are not as smart usually just don't survive their tbi because they don't have the cognitive reserve they don't have enough you know enough connectivity in their brain they don't have enough a dense enough neural network to just survive at all um they either remain in a coma indefinitely and die of pneumonia eventually or they just don't survive the tbi at all that is a neurological which i have eventually i'd like to test that based on you know some brain scan research but um well i've heard i've heard that 95 at least 95 percent of people who have a brain a ruptured brain aneurysm. Do not live. They don't survive till the ambulance gets there. They don't. They don't. And an ambulance never came for me. I literally, I don't remember how I got to the car. But my grandmother's four foot eight now. She was four foot eleven at the time. I'm five foot eight and have been since then. I know I got to the car of my own yeah. um, strength. Right. But I don't remember it. Honestly, and she drove me to the wrong hospital. <laughs> and back then, so, back then, neuro, you know, uh, traumatic brain stuff. We were that was something else we were talking about is survivorship. Um, most of us would have died, you know, before then, you know, just uh-huh. 10, 15 years before our brain injuries. And that's another reason why there's people are like, oh, my God, why why is there so little? Why aren't there? Why don't people know? Why don't? Simple. Most Most of us us would have died. Most of us do die. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, why does the doctor give such a grim, you know, well, they're probably not going to live. They're not going to make it, you know, whatever. Uh Most of us do die. Most of us don't make it. That's why. 
and why there's so little resources invested, most of us still die in the hospital, in the ICU. Our vital signs go crazy. You know, we, we have mm -hmm. neurostorming and or we have another aneurysm or we don't get better from the infection. Most of us do die. So that's why. So uh -huh. if you are a survivor, which is there's a reason it's such a, a badge of honor is because most of us don't make it. I should have right. frozen, I should have frozen to death in 94 that night. It was yeah. cool. Winter powers out my car. I get covered with snow and ice. I should be dead, mm -hmm. but I'm not. That may have been what saved you, actually. Yeah, no. Because you're, you're it lowered your body temperature, put right. you into like a hypothermic state. That's where a very it just kind of froze you in time. That's a very reasonable conclusion to draw. And they couldn't fly. They had a ground pound me, so they had the time to take to, you know, bring my temperature back up. I have no recollection, no right. memories, nothing. I am here, but I believe by an act of God, I'm here, and I'm here to do good. I'm Definitely. here to help. I'm here to, to help other people. That is what I believe. And many survivors think the same thing of themselves. And you know what? As long as they're out there helping other survivors, that is why, you know, and that is why you are here, I think. And you're you're helping the group. You are helping us to help others. That I have yet are. to meet a survivor of brain injury who didn't have a spectacular purpose for their life. Hmm. I mean, every single one of us survived because we weren't done yet. Now, I didn't know that when it happened to me, but I know it now. And I think it's I'm a, I'm a pretty big too. deal. You know, I'm not, I'm not tooting You're my rare. own horn, but I, I am. I'm a unicorn. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Because that's not my way. Maybe. All right, then let somebody else do your horn for you. It is extraordinary. Well, it is extraordinary what you have survived. And the fact that you survived with two of those and did not, uh, were not under the knife for that extended period of time says something extraordinary. And, you know, you're able to most, and your intellect is intact in, and you can assist other people. That is extraordinary and very damn rare. Yes, I believe it this is, is very rare. I believe this is part of your mission. Yeah. I really do. And the people I have been... I've always doing. known that the reason I'm on this planet and the reason I've gone through the things I've gone through is because there are people out there just like me who need people just like me mm -hmm. to survive. Because... Somebody who's never had a brain injury, they can't talk to me or anybody like me about what it's like and how to cope. Somebody who hasn't been through the traumas I've been through cannot, they, they can't articulate how to help me overcome that. Just based on on words on pages and books alone, right. it takes some sort of experience with, you know, coming out the other end of trauma yeah. to be able to talk about it in a way that someone like me would understand. And I can do that. Yep. I have a friend, even yeah, with my friends. brain injury, who sees a counselor on a regular basis. But she says she gets better counseling from me than she does her therapist because even though I'm not licensed and I've never claimed to be, I know how to talk to her. I know how to reach her in the middle of her pit because I've been in that pit so many times. Right. And I know how to get it out. So... You know, when I first had my brain injury, I hated God. I hated people. I hated everything but animals. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, my whole life, I felt like my life was taken from me. When I had that stroke, um, it was like the person I knew to be me, and this is going to sound crazy, 
but this is the best way I can describe it. It's like, you know, you have that little voice inside your head mm -hmm. that you recognize as you. But when I had my stroke, that voice changed somehow. Mm -hmm. I didn't yeah. recognize that person inside my head anymore. Mm -hmm. I knew that whoever I was to begin with no longer existed. And now there's this person living inside of me mm -hmm. that I don't recognize, has all my memories, mm -hmm. but I don't know who the hell this person is. Mm -hmm. Who is this? You know, so when I say that I was very confused, didn't know who I was, that's mm -hmm. what I mean. Mm -hmm. I literally didn't know who I was. I mean, and that was a 17-year-old's perception of the situation. Obviously, I didn't die, and there was no changing of the guards, guards in my mind, that little voice in my mind, but that was the way it felt at the time. Mm -hmm. And it, nobody would understand that unless mm -hmm. they'd been through it, you know? And, and the thing is, it's true for a lot of brain injury survivors. A lot of us do say, you know, the old, I've often said Mark 1.0 or mm -hmm. Mark who was died, but the truth is, I didn't die per se, but a lot of what I was and built myself upon was destroyed. You lost your identity. Precisely. And now I wouldn't say, because I never heard a voice exactly. I recognized them as my thoughts, but my thinking process had changed. But some people do hear it as a voice. They hear their thoughts. They recognize their thoughts as a voice. And uh -huh. it's a complex system that identifies self and other. Um it, it has to do with, I'm not even going down, talking about the left insula and the parietal systems responsible for self and other. That would be a neurology discussion and neuropsychiatric discussion about how you identify self from others and schizophrenia and psychosis. And it, we're not going to head. I have discussed a little bit of that in some other videos about about perception of self and other. Um, the neurology. We don't have time for that tonight. That is. <laughs> And it, it deals with brain networks for identifying self versus others, and it is a complex, a deeply complex topic, and it gets into uh, neurophilosophy and stuff like that. It's like, we don't have to get into right. that. You can find the video if you're really interested. Um, and like I said, it, it's fascinating stuff. And if you're a neuro nerd like I am, it would definitely be having me even like, you know, watching. But um, what it boils down to is that some of those systems that help you identify self, other, all those systems and the sensory input that we get from our bodies to help, you know, give you give emotional tone and things are disrupted. And when you're a kid, when you're an adolescent, you still are developing all those networks. They are not wired in yet. And they get ripped out by, you know, brain injury. And so you right. literally got to rewire all that stuff through relearning tons of experiences, make contact with new memories. So in effect, you are rebuilding a new self for you. Even though, yes, it's still, it's still mostly majority, 99% of it is still your old-fashioned brain is still you. But you've got to rewire a bunch of networks again that have been damaged with new connections. And um, I often told people that, you know, I felt like like a newborn. And that would be an accurate. In, a, in an adult body kind of thing. That would be an like, accurate perception. I didn't understand, you know, I mean, because. Yeah. I turned 18 six months after I got out of the hospital. You know, so I was an adult legally, mm -hmm. but I felt like a six-month-old baby. Mm -hmm. You know, I had that much perception of what it meant to be an adult. Mm -hmm. And right now, I'm 32 years out, and I still don't feel like I get it. You know? I've learned a lot. I've come a long way. Mm -hmm. But I still struggle with day-to-day -day things that other people mm -hmm. take for granted. You yeah. know? Mm -hmm. I, I feel you.
on that one. I mean, it's been well, like you. It's, well, it's been you. You're a longer survivor than I am. It's been thirty years for me, but it's been more than that for you. But um, it's been thirty-two. And you know, I was because I graduated early, um, as far as like you, you know, from with what I was doing, and I was working on my doctorate. Um, I was working on my doctorate earlier. Um, so I, um, you know, I was further along, but I still, after what happened to me, I, you know, I felt like, I somebody felt had, like you he, started over, right? Heck yes. Um, yeah. and a lot of people with TBIs would say the same thing. I mean, you have to learn to walk, talk, read, write, all that good stuff all over again. Confused. Mm -hmm. Who am I? And uh -huh. even, even worse, like if you've dedicated your life to a specific goal, you know what? What are you gonna do? Well, I, I, I didn't know what to do. The funny thing is, is that before my brain injury, I was well on my way to Kent State University mm. to get my RN, and. Uh, None of that happened. Mm. I didn't even graduate high school. I quit high school halfway through my senior year because I thought, what's the point? I'm not going to do anything. I don't need a high school education. Mm. It's over. My life is over. I, I get I'm that. never going to do anything beyond this. You know, so... I had no dreams, no aspirations. I didn't dare to dream. I didn't dare to hope for anything. Because, you know, it can all be taken away in a flash. What's the point? Screw life. That's And I was mad at God because I didn't blame God for what happened to me. But on the other hand, it is completely and totally... Within God's power to have let me avoid that whole catastrophe entirely. But, you know, would I have, would I be sitting here having this conversation with you if he had? I mean, is, am I so damn important that, or is my comfort and my ease of life so damn important that God should avoid allowing me a little suffering for his glory. Well, I always felt that that's not well, what I thought I was thinking about back then. Job, Go ahead. I'm sorry. I no, no, no. Um, because we're getting close to having to wrap up anyway. But Job, mm -hmm. I always thought Job was a great lesson. You know, yeah. make it a, you know, Job one, you know, chapter one, thirteen through twenty two. Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I shall return to the Lord. The Lord giveth, right. the Lord taketh away. In other words, right. I, but then again, that's very Jewish of me. <laughs> um, no, no, I no. I am, I am highly familiar with the book of Job. It's one of my favorites. Me too. You know, and the fact that, you know, I, I, I'm not going to sit here and say that I could go through what he went through. Oh, and not no. be met at God. Heck yeah. I mean, you know? it's extraordinary. But I think for us as Americans, the part of the lesson is that who are you? You know, who am I? Right. Our job is to do as told, love one another, help one another, be kind to one another. We're having a serious right. a deficit of all those things in this country these yes. days. Yes. Maybe a little bit yes. of a lesson in humility is what we need in this country. And but I yes. that, that is as far as I'm going to go with that one. But I am going to say it's like we have lessons to learn. We, we don't have lost have lessons to community. Learn. Yes. And that is what's wrong with this country. We, we it have, starts at the fact that we have lost community. The yes. fact that we at are the all local level, interconnected. Everyone, yep. <laughs> and my happiness and my flourishing depends on you as yes. does yours on me and on you we have and, lost that and we as survivors 
can teach that lesson to one another and we can be there for each other. That is the whole point with friends right. with manager. We are family and we need to right. and lift each other up. And I think that is another lesson that is taught in all of this. And I just like one of the reasons I love interacting with you is like, because mm -hmm. you're part of my, this big old family. You're one of my sisters and yes. I'm here for you. You know, I play big brother to a lot of people, people older than me as well as people than younger than I am. And people who are more. I'm not older than you. <laughs> no, no. But, you know, I'm just thinking too, right. you know, about people. I mean, I have people who are in their eighties who I yeah. play big brother to, and I love doing it. I'm a healer and a caretaker. I'm, you know, and that's always been the way I am. Always. And I've known since the age of six. If you want to ask me for my uh -huh. one strongest spiritual experience, or well, actually a few, I knew I was a healer from that age. But a healer does, isn't always somebody who lays their hand and says, be healed. They're, they come right. in many different flavors. And I think a majority of us right. are healers. But right. we, are, we are wounded healers. We are wounded. Right. That is different. So I will say anyone has messages or anything they want to leave for our newest host for Missy, please email or leave messages on the site. Put it in the messenger section of the site. She, you will be seeing her. She'll be talking about other topics within brain injury. She knows quite a bit about it. She's not only experienced, but she's she is quite intelligent, as you see. But we all struggle. And I think that's the other lesson here is that regardless of how experienced the survivor you are, Missy struggles. I struggle with pain and, and distress, and it's okay. The one thing it's never okay to do is simply quit. That is when right. your brain injury has defeated you. Fight, you fight, and you fight. You can be alone, but don't isolate. Right. Reach out to somebody. We want to help you. We want to support you. Yeah. Because without we're, one another, we lose this game yeah. called life. You are our family. So. That is what we are here. Exactly. Bye. Have a good one. Bye. You too.